Christians Against Poverty have been criticized for being Christians against poverty. It's not the against poverty bit, you understand. The National Secular Society is a big fan of the against poverty part. They want you to know that without any religious commitments themselves, they are totally against poverty. I mean, not enough to actually start a charity of their own, but they totally think it's a drag and a terrible idea and somebody should really do something. Um, somebody secular, obviously. Um, well, somebody secular did a report on CAP, Christians Against Poverty, and they released the findings last week. The London School of Economics calculated the benefit of CAP's work to society at 31.5 million pounds a year. It pointed to the 6,000 Christian volunteers working towards this public good and the fact that CAP lifts 10 Britons out of poverty, out of debt every day. Uh, these seem quite scientifically measurable metrics by which to assess CAP, uh, but the National Secular Society didn't really cite facts. Instead, it just complained that it was Christians doing all of this. Christians who actually talk about their Christianity as those spiritual values might have something to say to the problem of materialism. This kind of concern was voiced in the largely positive BBC documentary, which aired on Friday. Here, CAP founder John Kirkby was asked by a producer Helping anybody from a, from a faith perspective is a good thing, as is helping anybody from a non-faith perspective. Anybody helping anybody, it's a good thing. So why don't you just go into people's homes, offer them the service that you offer in terms of the practical service, yeah. and then walk away and not mention Jesus, not mention the Bible, and not pass on literature. Why not leave it at debt advice? Why bring Jesus into things? Why, why offer to pray with their clients? Oh, did you know that they offer to pray with their clients? Yeah, yeah, not sounding so virtuous now, are they? Prayer, yeah, you heard right, prayer. Critics say that this prayer is an emotional fee which clients are expected to pay for the service. That was the view of Steve Johnson from Advice UK in 2011. His body canceled the membership of CAP because offering prayer was deemed incompatible with membership in that secular body. Well, maybe he had a point. I mean, just take a look at the emotional pressure bearing down on this poor soul. Okay, Mick, I'll, I'll just say a real quick prayer for us then. Is that all right? Yeah. And witness, if you can bear it, the spiritual manipulation in this particularly brazen invitation to church. Were you thinking, were you thinking of popping by the church at some time before? Possibly. Yeah, yeah, because um, we've got a little crash and stuff for, for him to go into during the service and stuff, so you don't have to be with him the whole time. Right. Um, yeah, we have tea and coffee and stuff from like 10 o'clock. So if you fancy coming down on a Sunday, I should be there this week. How does he sleep at night? But this was the criticism back in 2011 by Advice UK. They said that if CAP offered prayer, it was effectively expecting clients to pay for their service by undergoing 30 seconds of staring at their shoes. No, says Steve Johnson, advisors must not offer or impose their values. Now, that's an interesting word to use as we consider debt, don't you think? Values. Debt, surely, is about getting our values wrong. Maybe we value stuff too much, or we value the wrong things, or maybe we value present expenditure over future happiness. Debt is a problem of value. So if debt counseling is not bringing a different value structure, it's not going to help. Let's imagine you seek to advise someone in debt and you have a purely scientific mindset. You're gonna be completely secular and bring no spiritual values to bear on things. Imagine you are Lawrence Krauss. Here's your worldview. The picture that science presents to us is, is in some sense uh, uncomfortable because what we've learned is that we are more insignificant than we ever could have imagined. You could get rid of us and all the galaxies and everything we see in the universe and it'll be largely the same. So we're insignificant on a scale that Copernicus never would have imagined. And in addition, it turns out the future is miserable. So the two lessons that I like to say I like to give is first, we're insignificant, and second, the future is miserable. Now, that sh you might think that should depress you. But in fact, it should embolden you and, and provide you a, a different kind of consolation. Because if the universe doesn't care about us, and if we're an accident in a remote corner of the universe, in some sense, it makes us more precious. The meaning in our lives is, is provided by us. We provide our own meaning. Sorry, why? We should make the most of our brief moment in the sun because 
this is all we have. This is all we have? Well, Lawrence, this for you is millions of dollars in book deals. This for the clients of CAP is crushing debt, despair, and suicidal thoughts. Bring Lawrence's scientific view into debt counseling. Let's see where it gets us. Imagine Lawrence's scientific view brought to bear on this guy's troubles. I've got a stage in my life now, to be honest with you, I could be dead tomorrow and I won't give a shit. Wow. Because everything's gone. My wife's gone, yeah. my, my mother's gone, my dad's gone, my little bro's gone. I'm not particular to live for. What's going to get him out of the hole he's in? Not a purely scientific and secular worldview. Here's what gets people out. It's what founded CAP and it's what they offer to others. The spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, release from darkness for the prisoners, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all who mourn. There is a God who steps down from his throne to expend himself for the poor, to liberate us and give us a future. That's how you fight poverty. Now listen, you do have to examine the ethics of charitable activities. I'm not saying there's no such thing as rice Christians, those who convert just to get stuff from Christian missionaries, okay? And I'm not saying that there's not a danger in Christian mission that we exploit positions of responsibility with vulnerable people. That is a problem, sure. And I spend a lot of time telling Christians that we mustn't do a bait and switch with the gospel. We're not trying to gain converts. We're trying to offer Christ. So we're not to lay a breadcrumb trail for people that sneakily leads them to church as though church was this totally separate thing. No, not that. None of that. No breadcrumb evangelism, please. But we do offer bread. We don't give debt counseling so that we can then take your soul. We give debt counseling and we give Christ because it's part of the same gracious offer to the world. You see, Christ became poor so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. Christ paid a ransom to free us. Christ releases us from our debts, spiritual and otherwise. So we speak of him and we share his love. And as we share his love, we speak his name. It is all of a piece. So, National Secular Society, if you've got good news that can lift people from debt, that can give them dignity and worth, no matter their mistakes and no matter their material situation. If you can give us hope, hope beyond material circumstances, if you can rally thousands of volunteers motivated by love and carrying a message of liberation and joy, go right ahead. And if you pull it off, we will not bemoan secularists against poverty. Why would we? We will thank God for you and for your work. But until then, do not bemoan that it's Christians against poverty. The Christian bit is the key. It's the 9th of October. This is Speak Life, and you're watching The Livecast.